This is Outpost of the Future, Australian Science Fiction, 1845-2021. to 2021. I am Dr Sean McMullen. Before starting, I need to point out that I have not included Aboriginal myths and legends in this talk. This is because I have little background in the area, and anything that I might say would be sure to be incomplete, inaccurate, or just plain wrong. This is a vast and fascinating part of Australian culture, however, and I encourage viewers to do a web search and explore the subject for themselves. The earliest known Australian science fiction story is Monster Mine by PGM, which appeared in the Oddfellows magazine in 1845. It speculated that by 1945, an enormous copper mine would finance splendid civic buildings, churches and universities, went on to predict a type of word processor, a phonotypographical chair, and speculated that electricity can make wheat grow faster. A lot more speculative fiction by Australians was published in the second half of the 19th century. European Australia was a thin band of coastal settlement around a vast unexplored interior, so many authors speculated about lost cities and utopias hidden inland. Former convicts made up much of the European population. Many exiled from Britain for demanding things like better working conditions, fair wages, and the right to vote. These ex-convicts and their children often became rich, well-educated, and influential. Australian labour reforms were among the most advanced in the world. Working conditions were better than in Britain. Men had the vote by 1901. And ten years later, women had the vote, too. Well before British women, Australia itself was becoming a real-world utopia. Thus it was that utopian fiction became popular. Wonderful lost civilizations remained the mainstay of Australian speculative fiction for eight decades, and often featured fabulously wealthy cities, reflecting an obsession with discovering gold and getting rich. Carlton Dawes' The Golden Lake was published in 1891 and features a great white city in Western Australia founded by the Chinese and crammed with gold and precious gemstones. Australia was identified with the lost continent of Lemuria in G. Firth Scott's 1898 novel, The Last Lemurian, describing the Lemurians as far more cultured and civilised than Europeans. As interest in utopian literature declined, stories about invasion took over. All through the 19th century, the French, Germans, Americans, Russians, Japanese, Chinese, and even the Spanish were suspected of planning to land a few shiploads of marines to seize the continent. In reality, there was no attack on Australia for the entire 19th century, but all this paranoia generated a market for invasion novels. These were more thrillers than science fiction, however. Most involved invasion by China or Japan, and emphasised that there was a vast amount of Australia to defend, but very few Australians to do the defending. In 1892, the Martians in joined the list of potential invaders, when Robert Potter's The Germ Growers was published, predating H.G. Wells's The War of the Worlds by five years. Two English explorers discover that Martians have set up a secret base in the remote Kimberley Mountains, and plan to unleash biological weapons on humanity using flying machines made invisible by stealth technology. The world is eventually saved by alien peacekeepers. In 1901, Australia's colonies united to actually become Australia. By now, a new generation of Australian authors was growing up reading the works of Fern and Wells, while in real-world science, X-rays, relativity, radio, cinemas and aircraft were proving factual wonders. The best of the works by these people were entertaining, successful, and as scientifically accurate as anything by British or American authors. Coates Brisbane was the first Australian to have a significant career in science fiction. After moving to Britain, he had 112 stories published between 1912 and 1948, but was something of a recluse, and practically nothing is known of his personal life. His stories were crammed with scientific ideas and innovations, including one in the Yellow magazine in 1926 featuring a man wearing a celluloid suit as protection against carnivorous ants. Today he is almost unknown, 
and his career is an example of how transitory magazine fiction can be. Even good fiction must be available long term on library shelves if it is to endure, and none of his stories were published in book form until decades after his death. Earl Cox's novel, Out of the Silence, was serialised in Melbourne's Argus newspaper in 1919, republished in book form, then dramatised for radio in 1940, becoming Australia's first science fiction radio drama. An Australian farmer unearths a capsule from an ancient civilization containing the superwoman Iranani. She is brilliant, telepathic, charismatic, can self-teleport, and, generally speaking, Anani was the first non-stereotypical, highly individualistic female character in 20th century Australian science fiction. The novel combines racial, utopian and lost civilization themes, and while it appears to disown racist theories, it does have a strong eugenics undercurrent. Out of the Silence remained the most successful Aust Australian science fiction work until Neville Schutz On the Beach was published in 1957. The American and, and British pioneers of the 1920s and 30s are well known, but Australia also had a significant presence in this period. Only Australian authors who spent time overseas in the 1930s produced anything like a substantial body of work, however. James Morgan Walsh moved to London in 1929, and his lifetime output was over a hundred books, mainly thriller, mystery and crime novels. His output included three novels that were classic space operas. Vandals of the Void, published in Wonder Quarterly in 1931, is the first verified Australian work to appear in the American pulp science fiction magazines. Vandals was a novel of space piracy. The evil Mercurians try to do a bit of plundering in the shipping lanes between Earth and Mars, but the Space Guard intervenes and defeats them. For the 1930s, Walsh's luxury space liners and enormous battle fleets were new and exciting, and he was the first science fiction author to stage a large-scale battle in space. Alan Connell was 19 when The Reign of the Reptiles was published in Wonder Quarterly in August 1935. His Dreams End featured the famous Frank R. Paul cover artwork of a battleship floating upside down above New York. In the latter story, the universe is a dream in the mind of a cosmic superbeing, and the dream is falling apart as it wakes up. The 1940s were a very strange time for Australian science fiction. In April 1940, a wartime import embargo cut Australia off from American science fiction. Local publishers, who were largely clueless about either science or science fiction, churned out some appallingly bad works to fill the gap in demand. In one novel, a mad scientist does a brain transplant with a pocket knife. In another, a zombie rat robs a bank. The 1947 novel, Tomorrow and Tomorrow, is the only science, local science fiction novel of the decade that had any sort of literary merit. Marjorie Barnard and Flora Eldershaw wrote it between 1942 and 1944 under the joint pseudonym of M. Barnard Eldershaw, and it is a view of Australia past and present through the eyes of a 24th century writer. While more social commentary than science fiction adventure, it nevertheless features some innovations, such as a psychic polling booth, it is the only Australian science fiction work to have fallen foul of the Commonwealth censor, and sections of it had to be deleted before publication. In 1948, Transport Publishing launched Scientific Thriller, a series of novellas written by house authors using pseudonyms, and featuring a synthesis of crime and science fiction. A standard merge from almost bearable to ghastly but a monthly series survived until May 1952. Titles included Atomic Death, The Time Thief, and Jaws of Doom. In Cosmic Calamity, a mad scientist invents a way to let deadly rays from space penetrate the protection of the atmosphere. <laughs> 
A rather more sane scientist investigates the charred circles that appear in the countryside and raises the alarm before the rays destroy Melbourne and Sydney. By now the local market was again being penetrated by American science fiction because magazines like Astounding brought out Australian editions to bypass the import ban. Locally written science fiction could not cope, hope to, cope to compete, but publishers did not give up easily. In March 1950, the magazine Thrills Incorporated was launched. Crime fiction author Alan Yates describes how the editor would hand him a piece of ghastly cover art advertising a non-existent story by a non-existent writer, telling him to produce 3,000 words on the subject by a deadline. Thrills folded in 1952. By then, reprint magazines like Fantasy Fiction and American Science Fiction were sneaking even more American works past the customs inspectors and the import embargo did not apply to British magazines. Thanks to faster, cheaper international airmail, talented Australian authors such as Norma Hemming, Wynne Whiteford and Frank Brining were no longer daunted by the logistics of submitting overseas. It was finally possible to be a successful international, the published writer and still live in Australia. So local authors reinvented Australian science fiction. Frank Brining began writing in 1952 with Operation in Free Flight and became known as Australia's Arthur C. Clarke. His stories featured a space doctor and even an Australian space station and were as good as anything by Asimov, Chandler or Clarke. In 1987, Graham Stone published his research into science fiction published in Australian men's magazines and revealed a whole new body of local science fiction. Literally hundreds of locally written science fiction stories had appeared in these magazines from the 1930s to the 1970s. The journalist Jean Jaynes was a typical author, and his work was intelligent and entertaining, although not state-of-the-art. In The Unseen, published in Peep in 1955, a starship is wrecked on a planet where the life forms are invisible to human eyes. The inhabitants are intelligent and friendly, so friendly that they interbreed with the human explorers. The children are only partly visible. Meantime, Australian publishers continued to cash in on the demand for new and scientifically interesting science fiction from overseas. Science Fiction Library Selected Science Fiction Magazine and Science Fiction Monthly were all published locally, bypassing the import ban. Intriguingly, some stories by American authors were published in these magazines that only ever saw print in Australia. Britain's John Carnell provide, proved to be a powerful and generous champion of Australian science fiction. Between 1957 and 1962, Australian stories in his British magazine New Worlds made up 10% of the total, outnumbering works by even American authors. For the first time, there was a distinct group of Australian authors in the overseas markets, rather than just occasional stories by people who happened to live in Australia. Overseas readers react. Many magazines ran a reader's poll with each issue, and the results tell us a lot. A. Bertram Chandler, John Duxter and Wynne Whiteford averaged out at the middle of the field, while Norma Hemming scored toward the top when her stories were polled. Frank Brining's story, on the average, actually won a New World's Poll in 1957, becoming Australia's first speculative fiction to win an international recognition. In the early 1960s, two of Lee Harding's stories in New Worlds also won the poll for their issue. Thus, Australian stories were about as well received as any from British authors. But style was another matter. Read a couple of dozen works from this period, and it becomes clear that while Australians were writing good, traditional science fiction, there was little identifiably Australian in their work. A. Bertram Chandler was about to change all this. In 1958, Chandler introduced his best-known character, Captain Grimes, and began to chronicle his adventures in the Rim Worlds. The Rim was modelled on Australian coastal ports and South Pacific islands, and was a sprawling, frontier scenario at the edge of the galaxy filled with outcasts, tramp ships, pirates and exotic ports. Chandler was a ship's captain, 
and wrote science fiction in his cabin while off duty. While not the first author to introduce shipboard protocols and routines to space travel, he did so with more authority. Another Australian who brought real-life experience to his science fiction was Ivan Southall. His background as a flying boat captain gave him much the same credibility with aircraft as Chandler had with ships, and his Simon Black novels featured a hero similar to Buck Rogers. Simon Black's science fiction adventures began in 1954, and just as Chandler's Captain Grimes was the author's space-fearing alter ego, Southall himself was reflected in Simon Black. Southall later became the first Australian to win the Carnegie Medal for children's literature. Evel Schutz's 1957 novel, On the Beach, ranks among the best Australian science fiction of the century. A nuclear war with cobalt bombs has poisoned the Northern Hemisphere, and the radioactivity is slowly drifting south. In Melbourne, people are getting on with their lives, yet they have been issued with suicide capsules, or when the radiation sickness becomes unbearable. Everyone is close to death by the end, and no hope is offered. On the Beach gave the world a much-needed fright about the consequences of nuclear war. Perhaps the novel's greatest achievement was to help prevent its own prediction. There had been many other post-nuclear war stories before 1957, but it took shoot to give the scenario a human face. Stanley Kramer adapted it as a film starring Gregory Peck, Ava Gardner and Fred Astaire in 1959, and it was revived as a telemovie in 2000. In the 1950s, the local fan movement began organising national conventions, and at four of these conventions, Australia's first science fiction plays were staged. They were written by the dynamic Norma Hemming, who also acted in them, typed the scripts and sewed the costumes. At the sixth national convention in 1958, Hemming directed The Matriarchy of Renock and starred as the alien queen, Venaris, a misogynistic astronaut lands on a planet dominated by women, and after realising that he cannot get his way with his version of charm, he kidnaps the Queen and flees back to Earth. Relativistic time dilation results in the spacecraft reaching Earth years after a fleet from Renock has arrived and conquered the place. It was revived in 2010 at the World Science Fiction Convention, this time directed by myself. Hemming was also a pioneer of hard science fiction in Australia, and her 1958 story, The Debt of Lasso, is considered to be her best work. The aliens of Lasso have conquered Earth and crushed human resistance, but Lasso's government changes. The new administration wants to liberate Lasso's colonies, but discovers that humanity's spirit has been broken so thoroughly that humans must be taught to rebel. Hemming died of lung cancer in 1960, at the age of 31, yet that was not the end of her career. Her eight romance novels, written as Norena Hillard, were far more successful than even her science fiction, and were still earning royalties in 2002. In 2010, her collected works were republished in book form as Dwellers in Silence, and in that same year, the Norma Hemming Award was established to commemorate the author's life and achievements. In 1959, the Australian government finally repealed the wartime import embargo that excluded American magazines and books, but by then many local authors were already prospering in overseas markets. From 1961 to 1970, there were 92 Australian authors active, with over 300 works of long and short fiction published. Selling novels overseas was harder than selling stories, but by now even that began to change. Chandler sold his first story. Chandler sold his first novel, *The Rim of Space*, overseas in 1961, beginning a series that became one of the most important achievements in Australian science fiction. In 1963, *Beyond the Galactic Rim* became the first Australian science fiction collection, although published by Ace of New York. Chandler proved that an Australian can have a substantial career in science fiction while actually living in Australia selling 23 stories, 19 novels, and two collections in the 1960s alone. Chandler became the first Australian to be made a guest of honour at a World Science Fiction Convention, was the first Australian author to have a fan following, and remained the country's foremost science fiction author until his death in 1984. Overseas publishers soon helped other Australians get published, 
but Horwitz Publications continued to be an important local resource. It was a family company that had been established in 1921 and had published a number of science fiction magazines and novels during the 19 years of wartime import restrictions. It published Damien Broderick's A Man Returned in 1965, which was Australia's first locally published science fiction collection. Broderick began his career with stories in the Monash University student mag magazine, Chaos. His 1963 story, All My Yesterdays, is a lightweight literary, literate entertainment describing the psychoanalysis of Lazarus. He made his first overseas sale the, the following year, with the sea's furthest end. While continuing to write science fiction in his spare time, he went on to become a senior fellow in the School of Culture and Communications at the University of Melbourne before moving to the US. He has written or edited over 50 books, been runner-up for the Campbell and Sturgeon Awards, and his 1982 novel, The Judas Mandala, is credited with the first appearance of the term virtual reality. John Baxter was 23 years old when his first story was published. He is best known as the editor of the first anthology of Australian science fiction, the first Pacific book of Australian science fiction published by Angus and Robertson in 1968. This presented a sample of science fiction by Australians from the 1960s, displaying the author's growing concern with style, raising the profile of locally written science fiction, and, most importantly, making the stories available in libraries long after the magazines that had published them had been culled. Baxter's own science, short science fiction reflects influences from the new wave style of writing been in vogue. Apple, published in 1966, is a surrealistic work in the extreme, featuring a gigantic apple tunnelled by human miners. Some of Peter Carey's earlier stories can also be described as new wave science fiction and were published in literary and academic magazines in 1972. In his very first work, Crabs, the end of the world as we know it, traps characters in a drive-in movie venue. Peeling and A Windmill in the West are also identifiably New Wave science fiction. Jack Wadhams had more short science fiction published in the 1960s than any other Australian, even though his first story, There is a Crooked Man, was only published in 1967. This tour of the future of crime had multiple reprints and established Wadhams as a world-class science fiction author. Born in England, he migrated to Australia in 1955, yet it was in the American magazine Analog where he made his name. His style is generally droll and witty, if a little sharp. Split Personality, published in 1968, features a criminal surgically split down the middle to turn him into a starship's psychic navigation beacon. Who's a what's a? is one of Wadham's best works, exploring the impact of cheap sex change technology. Lee Harding began his career in British magazines, but went on to establish himself as a young adult author in the 1970s. His most successful novel, Displaced Person, won the Alan Marshall Award. He also won the Dittmar Award for Australian Science Fiction three times. His 1970 Dittmar winner was Dancing Gerontius, set in an overpopulated world where the enormous ageing population is culled once a year with chemically induced orgiastic not revels. Seven major television series for children and teenagers were produced in Australia in the 1960s. The Stranger, which screened in 1964, featured alien refugees looking for a new home on Earth, a land in the mountains west of Sydney. And although given a hard time by the Australian authorities at first, an enlightened Prime Minister intervenes and makes peace. One Ginger was broadcast in 1967 and was based on the fact that figures in some Aboriginal cave paintings resembled astronauts in spacesuits. The series featured a tough female military commander, an innovation that even Star Trek had not managed by then. Both series were later broadcast in Britain. In 1966, a TV series was set aboard an internationally crewed starship that cruised the galaxy sorting out problems on distant worlds, but it was not Star Trek. 
The Interpret Taurus was a show for children, and its first episode beat the first broadcast of Star Trek to air by three weeks. Unfortunately, the plotting, production standards, and technical content reflected the show's small budget, but it was successful enough to spawn sequel series Vega 4 in 1968 and Phoenix 5 in 1970. Overall, these space operas placed too much emphasis on lightweight comic entertainment. Some episodes were promising, and the series made money, but the formula did not produce lasting success. Young science fiction viewers moved on to better overseas shows, and it was not until the 1990s that quality Australian science fiction for television returned. In 1969, Australian fans inaugurated the DITMARS, Australia's first science fiction awards. The DITMARS were modelled on the Hugo Awards and were voted on by members of the Australian National Science Fiction Convention. They allowed local authors to add the words award-winning to their publicity, and this was invaluable when competing for attention against big names in overseas markets. The 1969 winner in the original science fiction category was Chandler's Spartan Planet, a novel set in a monosexual society. It was republished locally by Horwitz as False Fatherland. In 1969, an unusual experiment began when Vision of Tomorrow was created, financed by the Sydney millionaire and science fiction fan, Ron Graham. It was edited and published in Britain by Phil Harbottle and meant to contain a quota of Australian stories. Vision published many works of excellent quality and co and collected Australia's first Hugo nomination for a professional work. The best Australian contributors included Harding's Dancing Gerontius and Chandler's The Bitter Pill, both of which won Dittmar Awards. Distribution problems caused the magazine's demise after 12 months. The 1970s was a decade of breakthroughs. In 1975, a World Science Fiction Convention was hosted in Australia for the first time. Two science fiction small presses were established, and Australia's first Hugo Award winner was published. The newly emerging local film industry was also showing a strong interest in science fiction. A writing workshop was held in association with the Worldcon. It was a live-in event in the Dandenong Mountains, and a group of carefully selected candidates worked intensively on their stories, overseen by Ursula Le Guin. Some participants were put in contact with overseas agents and editors, and an anthology of stories from the workshop, The Altered Eye, was published by the newly established small press in Australia. Did the workshop achieve anything worthwhile? The answer is not clear. Some participants went on to have more fiction published, but many other, overseas, many, many other authors established their careers and won awards without workshops or mentors. What the workshop did do was raise the profile of Australian science fiction with government funding bodies. When Ursula Le Guin praised something, people listened. In Australia was not the first science fiction small press in Australia. Paul Collins established Void Publications some months before the Worldcon, then published Void magazine. He bought reprint rights for works by overseas authors, but included fiction by Australians. Boyd's May 1976 issue contained the first story from a small press to get a Titmar nomination, Chandler's Kelly Country. After several issues, Boyd morphed into the anthology series, Worlds, which also pioneered Australian fantasy. In the late 1960s, fantasy stories about elves, wizards, heroic knights and alluring maidens had developed a following overseas, yet locally written fantasy did not reach readers until it appeared in the world's anthologies a decade later. In the decade between the Aussiecon and Aussiecon II World Science Fiction Conventions in Australia, several science fiction movies were produced locally. Director Peter Weir made the enchanting fantasy Picnic at Hanging Rock in 1975. Picnic's theme was the disappearance of several schoolgirls at an Aboriginal sacred site in 1901, and was so convincing that some viewers checked newspaper archives to find more details about the fictional event. It won BAFTA and Saturn Awards for cinematography, and screenplay writer Cliff Green won the Australian Writers Guild Award for Best Feature Film Screenplay category. Two years later, 
Sydney was destroyed in The Last Wave, also directed by Weir and starring Dr. Kildare's Richard Chamberlain. The 1979 movie Mad Max had a powerful revenge theme and was set during violent apocalyptic breakdowns in society. Written by Australian doctor George Miller, it won three AFI awards and was produced for a mere $200,000, less than for some television commercials. It earned $100 million worldwide, 50 times the cost of production. In 1981, post-apocalyptic Mad Max 2, The Road Warrior, was also directed and co-written by Miller. It won a Saturn Award, five AFI Awards, and was the first Australian work of fiction to get a Hugo nomination. Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome of 1985 was the first Australian science fiction movie to be nominated for a Golden Globe. Back in the world of print, more semi-professional magazines were getting beginners the opportunity to display their work. These included Void, Nexus, The Cygnus Chronicler, Crux and Futuristic Tales. Australian science fiction criticism and review was given the science fiction's ultimate prize in 1980 when a Hugo Award was won by an Australian, Peter Nichols, for editing the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction. The second and third editions also won Hugos, and Tasmanian Don Tuck won a Hugo for the third volume of his Encyclopedia of Science Fiction and Fantasy in 1984. George Turner was an accomplished mainstream novelist and had won the Miles Franklin Award before he wrote Australia's first science fiction trilogy, but his most famous work was The Sea and Summer, published in 1987. It was the first and earliest detailed, high-profiled treatment of climate change and won the Arthur C. Clarke Award. Turner was made guest of honour for the 1999 World Science Fiction Convention in Melbourne, but died for the stroke before the event. Amiga Science Digest was launched in 1981 and had a similar format to America's Omni magazine. Amiga published two locally written stories per issue, had a circulation of 40,000 copies, and made a healthy profit until contractual issues forced it to close in 1987. It launched the careers of several local authors, and two of its stories won Ditmar Awards. It was Amiga that gave Terry Dowling his breakthrough as a science fiction author and after a series of award-winning works in the 1980s, his link story collection, Rhinoceros, was published in 1990. It contained a vision of a future Australia in which European and Aboriginal nations and cultures have settled their differences and coexist more or less peacefully. Dowling's consistent and detailed use of science, technology, mythology and local geographical settings continued in subsequent link stories collections and earned him yet more awards. For a time, he held more Ditmar Awards than any other Australian author. For their first few years, the entire output from Boyd in Australia was short fiction. Boyd was eventually renamed Corey and Collins and in 1980 published its first three novels. All three were Ditmar nominees in 1981, yet that year's winner came from Australia. Damien Broderick's The Dreaming Dragons was published in the USA about the same time. Nobody is sure which edition came first. Whatever its origins, The Dreaming Dragons was an outstanding work and was runner-up for the John W. Campbell Award. The 1980 small presses published science fiction books in print runs ranging from a couple of dozen to 5,000. These books dramatically changed the publication of science fiction in Australia. In 1983, Corey and Collins published four books, the anthology Frontier Worlds, and three novels, but Collins would publish only one more novel before he wound up the company. It had made a small profit, published 17 books, had 11 Didmar nominations and one winner. Having a stable market for science fiction encouraged people to start writing who otherwise might have remained readers. And between 1973 and 1993, the number of science fiction works published per year tripled. Boyd in Australia also revived or boosted many established authors' careers. Out of Australia's 14 books, most were poetry, 
autobiography, criticism, or mainstream fiction, and only six were clearly science fiction, yet it remained a major influence in local science fiction. In 1983, the anthology Dreamworks, edited by David King, was published, and while some of its stories were marginal as either science fiction or fantasy, all four of the 1984 Ditmar nominations for short fiction were from Dreamworks. The late 1980s were a very bad time for Australian science fiction publishers. The Australia Council's Literature Board had a change of emphasis in grant allocation, putting many small presses out of business. In spite of this, Peter McNamara of Adelaide decided to publish a science fiction magazine, and in 1986, Abhelion appeared. Its stories won two Ditmars, and several were republished, but distribution problems killed it early in 1987. Yet that was not the end of the Apelian brand. Nothing was ever the same after 1990, which has been called the most exciting year in the history of Australian science fiction and fantasy. Apelian magazine was reborn as Apelian Publications and launched two books at the 1990 National Science Fiction Convention in, in Melbourne, Turner's Pursuit of Miracles and Dowling's Rhinoceros. Rhinoceros had an alluringly beautiful cover by Nick Stathopoulos, who later made a name for himself in mainstream art. Apelian had no literature board grant and had to make twice as many sales as its predecessors just to break even. Yet it survived and prospered. Rhinoceros made it into the Locus magazine, a prestigious recommended reading list, and it won a Ditmar Award. This is the second of Dowling's linked collections, the 1992 Blue Tyson. In March 1991, McNamara approached me for, an, uh, for a collection. A year later, almost to the day, the first copies of Call to the Edge came off the press. It was launched at the National Convention, and here I met Neil Gaiman, who told me the best form of promotion was word of mouth. Following his advice, I sent out dozens of review and promotion copies, and the book paid back my advance and made a profit. It also made the Locus recommended reading list and got a Ditmar nomination. McNamara now asked me for a novel. Back in the 1980s, I had submitted Voices in the Light to a New York publisher, waited 18 months, and then was told that the manuscript had been lost. I resubmitted. It was rejected. Apelian accepted Voices in the Light within days, and in 1994 it became Apelian's first novel. It was launched by Peter Nichols and William Gibson, sold out, was runner-up for a Ditmar Award, and was very well reviewed. Most importantly of all, a New York agent decided to recruit me after reading Voices in the Light. Apelian again showed that small presses were better attuned to innovative and edgy science fiction than most mainstream publishers, were likely to take a chance with new authors, and could help those authors move on to larger markets. It had four Ditmar winners from 17 nominations, and was still viable when Peter McNamara closed it down, having decided that Australia's booming science fiction market no longer needed help from his sort of small press. In 1990, Martin Middleton's fantasy epic, Circle of Light, was launched by the mainstream publisher Pan Australia. In what was then quite a bold experiment, Pan put a substantial marketing campaign behind the book. It sold 15,000 copies over its first three print runs, which for Australia was the bottom end of bestseller status. Its popularity showed that there was a large potential market for Australian fantasy. Other authors, such as Tony Shilato and Dirk Strasser, followed. Sales of fantasy expanded, and science fiction prospered by association. In 1995, HarperCollins Australia joined in and was rewarded by large sales of fantasy novels by Sarah Douglas. In hindsight, it is astounding that nobody had noticed this potential market earlier. All through the 1960s and 70s, Chandler sold very well in Australia, although his books were published in America, then imported, distributed and promoted by big Australian publishers. All this activity left quite a large niche for small presses. Perth fans founded Eidolon magazine, which ran from 1990 to 2002, while Melbourne's 
Borealis magazine was also launched in 1990 and is still running. In his 13th year's best science fiction anthology, Gardner Dozwa called Orealis and Eidolon two of the three best semi pro zines anywhere. In 1995, Orealis inaugurated the Orealis Awards as an alternative to the Ditmars. Since their inception, the Ditmars have been plagued by eligibility anomalies, accusations of rigging, and, and unrepresentative voting. The Orealis Award used panels of well read experts to decide upon winners and soon developed a lot of credibility with commercial publishers. By the mid-90s, the internet was bringing the world ever closer to Australia. Eidolon was the first Australian science fiction magazine to establish a website, making a large selection of its stories, artworks and articles available for free, and sponsoring home pages for several authors. In 1997, Borealis established a website as well. The young adult market expanded during the 1990s, and the highest profile works included Julian Rubinstein's award-winning computer games trilogy, Space Demons. This featured adolescents resolving issues and problems by rejecting aggression and using goodwill and compromise. It was adapted for stage performance and taken on a national tour. By now, Paul Collins was making so much money from writing children's and young adult science fiction that he sold his bookshop to concentrate on writing. He was soon able to buy an office, auditorium and warehouse for his next small press, Ford Street Publishing. Technology helped trigger the increased output of science fiction by Australian authors in the 1990s. Word processors involved polished, clean manuscripts to be produced cheaply and quickly, and enabled magazines and small press books to be produced with far lower overheads. The growth in private internet use from 1991 onwards made overseas correspondence and submissions far easier from geographically remote Australia. The story of Australian science fiction in the 1990s cannot be separated from that of Australian fantasy. Paul Collins pioneered Australian heroic fantasy in his Worlds anthology series in the 1970s, and Keith Taylor's Bard fantasy novels were published in the 1980s. Local Commercial fantasy novels were virtually absent from the shortlists for awards, however, which were dominated by science fiction that included Dowling's future Aboriginal technology, the socially astute visions of Turner, the hard science fiction of Greg Egan, and Techno Steampunk by myself. Finally, in 1997, fantasy works by Lucy Sussex and Russell Blackford won a Ditmar Awards, and around this time, the new Aurealis Awards introduced a specific fantasy category. What was the problem? In Australia, commercial publishers were more familiar with mainstream literature. They seldom sought advice from the science fiction and fantasy community and preferred works with conservative content. On the other hand, fantasy was the powerhouse that drove sales, so why change? The best local science fiction titles sold around 5,000 copies, yet some fantasy novels sold over 20 times as many. The 1990s was also the beginning of a golden age for Australian science fiction on television. The series The Girl from Tomorrow was a young adult time travel adventure. It cost a staggeringly low $2.4 million for six hours of television and followed the adventures of Elena, a girl from the year 3000 thrown back in time. The producer Jonathan Schiff arrived on the scene with Ocean Girl, which ran from 1994 to 1999 and even had its own fan club. Ocean Girl featured an aquatic alien girl who was as much at home in the water as on land. Schiff went on to have a very successful career specialising in young adult science fiction series for television. Round the Twist ran from 1990 to 2000 and was a mixture of surrealism, comedy, science fiction and fantasy by the children's author Paul Jennings. The plots of the standalone episodes were often highly original, such as a TV remote that could fast forward, stop or rewind reality, a green baby from a cabbage patch, and the Viking invasion of a 20th century Australian fishing port. Spellbinders ran from 1995 to 1997 and had the most original and well-realised alternate world of any Australian series. 
the electricity-based Renaissance-like parallel Australia of the Spellbinders. Its principals, Rihanna and Paul, were allowed their first and only kiss at the end of the 26th episode, moments before they were to be separated forever. Yet that sort of squeaky clean content helped the series sell into over nine dozen countries. The increase in published Australian science fiction and fantasy fiction of the 1990s was accompanied by greater recognition for both print and media works. Greg Egan's stories won more readers' polls in Britain's Interzone magazine than those by British and American authors, and his 1994 reductionist novel about virtual reality, Permutation City, won the 1995 Campbell Award. His novella Oceanic won Australia's first Hugo Award for fiction in 1999, but curiously, Oceanic got only a nomination from the Aurealis Award judges and no nomination from the Dittmar voters. Egan still holds the record for the most Hugo nominations for fiction of any Australian. No Australian novel has ever reached the Hugo shortlist, although in 2000, Egan's Terranesia and my novel, Souls in the Great Machine, tied for 10th place in the nominations for the Hugo Bullet. Oceanic is a powerful statement about religious experiences as the basis of faith. The central character, Martin, lives on the planet Covenant, and like Earth, it has large surface oceans. His faith is based on an intensely moving religious experience in his childhood, but as an adult he discovers that an endemic alien microbe might have been responsible for his life-changing childhood rapture. Jack Dan, an American author and editor, migrated to Australia in 1994. In 1997, he became the first Australian resident to win a Nebula Award for his novella Da Vinci Rising. The following year, he and his wife, Janine Webb, edited an anthology intended to present the best in original Australian genre short fiction at the end of the decade, century and millennium. Dreaming Down Under became the first Australian book to win a World Fantasy Award and was the ultimate statement on short science fiction and fantasy from Australia at the time. By now the best of Australians science fiction and fantasy authors could earn a good income from fiction and some are writing full time. Statistics show that the most successful science fiction authors tended to be male in the 1990s, while most Australian epic fantasy was increasingly written by women, who were making a lot more money. Like Egan, I established myself with short fiction published in Britain, America and Australia. My first novel, published overseas, The Centurion's Empire, won an Aurealis Award in 1999, but my signature work was the steampunk Great Winter trilogy of novels. It began with Souls in the Great Machine in 1999, which was set in a technically regressed but stylish future Australia, ruled by a rather psychopathic cast of warrior librarians. The series won a Dittmar and Aurealis Award. One last breakthrough in the 1990s was the first chronicling of local science fiction's own history. Until then, only brief accounts in convention handbooks and encyclopedia entries documented how Australian science fiction had developed. But this all changed when Melbourne University Press published the, Mel the MUP Encyclopedia of Australian Science Fiction and Fantasy in 1998. Edited by Paul Collins, it was launched by Neil Gaiman, became highly valued as a buying guide for school librarians, and eventually sold out. Strange Constellations, A History of Australian Science Fiction by Russell Blackford, Van Eiken and myself was published the following year and was the first academically formal and comprehensive account of Australian science fiction. Both books won awards for criticism. When the new millennium arrived, the tools already existed for an unprecedented boom in self-publishing. The early years of the new century saw two or three times more Australian science fiction, fantasy and horror works published than in the previous century and a half. From this point it is no longer possible to comment on more than a fraction of the works published, so I will try to describe what happened with statistics. Australians are a small part of the international science fiction and fantasy scene. But how are they rating overall? 
Locust Magazine's annual polls of its readers from either side of the 1990s boom show that per head of population, Australians were far better represented in the polls than authors from other countries. The polls also showed that female Australian authors were establishing a stronger presence and were well regarded by the readers. The ratio of local male to female authors had been steady at about 15% in the 1970s and 80s, but by the mid-1990s, women were 33% of active Australian science fiction and fantasy authors. In 2010, the number of published works by women exceeded those by men for the first time. In 1995, the anthology She's Fantastical, edited by Lucy Sussage and Judith Buckridge, was the first anthology of Australian women's speculative writing. It was highly regarded and was deservedly shortlisted for a World Fantasy Award. Justine Labalaster's 2003 book, The Battle of the Sexes in Science Fiction, made her the first Australian woman to receive a Hugo nomination. Based on the author's PhD thesis, it was a long overdue study of literary sexual dimorphism in science fiction. By 2008, self-publishing, electronic publication and self-promotion via social media had transformed the landscape of Australian science fiction. In 1987, the Dittmar Awards Committee could not identify more than six short works of science fiction or fantasy eligible for the award. In 2010, the number of eligible works was two 184, and the local social media profiles of authors were playing a role in getting works nominated. Publishers began examining those social media profiles when considering the sales potential of books rather than checking if the work was a good read. 2011, my steampunk story, Eight Miles, was nominated for the Hugo Award and came second in the final ballot. It was praised highly in reviews had multiple reprints and was translated into Russian, Chinese and Czech. Back in Australia, it did not even make the shortlist of any local awards. There was so much short fiction being published that one could no longer expect people to notice even an outstanding work. In his 2013 talk at London's Barbican Centre, Neil Gaiman said that finding a good book used to be like finding a plant in a desert. But now it was like looking for that plant in a jungle. In 2010, the unthinkable happened when an Australian science fiction author found himself standing on a stage with an Oscar in his hands. Sean Tan's 2009 animation, The Lost Thing, won an Oscar and eight other film awards. It cost only $500,000 to make. A boy finds a creature, rather like a giant crockpot with legs, and takes it home. Even though it is about as conspicuous as an elephant in a kitchen, everyone tries to ignore it. Tan also won Hugo Awards for Professional Art in 2010 and 2011, three World Fantasy Awards and eight Dittmars. In 2014, a crossover horror movie, The Babadoc, won an astounding 53 awards, including a Bram Stoker. A young mother's life and health unravel as her son obsesses about a picture book monster. The 2015 zombie series, Glitch, featured dead people coming back to life in a country town for no apparent reason, only to find that their partners, friends and relatives had moved on with their lives. In film and television, Australia had become known as a safe, cheap, high-quality production venue, where the locals spoke English, there were nice hotels and no wars, yet plenty of clever and skilled people charged attractive rates for high-quality work. Most of the science fiction, fantasy and horror shows pouring out of Australian production houses were seldom identifiable as Australian, however. In spite of some obvious successes, Australian producers apparently had little faith in Australian writers when it came to science fiction for adults. Back in the world of printed science fiction and fantasy, promotion and distribution remain as much of a problem today as they were decades ago. Large companies with national distribution have sales teams to promote their books right across the country, 
promotion on social media seemed to be the solution for self-publishing authors until everyone began promoting themselves and drowned each other out. The sheer number of works being published is astounding. In 1973, 31 works were eligible for the Didmar Awards. By 1993, it was 97. And in 2011, there were 848 works eligible. The boom tapered off, and by 2019, the total had dropped to 615 works, largely because aspiring authors discovered that while electronic publishing made it easier to get their fiction published, it also made it easier for everyone else. I call this Disillusion Valley, the trough that follows a statistical peak. Anyone wanting a Ditmar or Aurealis Award for original fiction in 2011 was facing 10 times more competition than 20 years earlier. Profits also decreased. Sales of only 100 copies were once considered to be a joke, but were now thought reasonable. It is a myth that the digital revolution removed all constraints on publishing. The gatekeepers of commercial publishing still controlled promotion and distribution, and used these resources to promote a very small number of high-profile authors. Self-published authors could gather a few dozen Facebook friends and invite them to like their promotional pages, but everyone else was doing the same. I tested myself on the Tangent Online recommendations for 2019 and managed to pick only half of the Australian authors listed before trying again with a computer and I'm meant to be an authority. In the Ditmar Awards, recent changes in gender balance have been spectacular, with women receiving over two-thirds of the nominations for fiction, and writing nearly nine out of ten winners. Remember, only four works by women had ever won a Ditmar for fiction in the quarter century to 1993. Today, works by Australian women have become absolutely dominant in terms of local recognition, although they only write about half of the total works. What about quality? Using works recommended by Locus Magazine's reviewers as a guide, we can measure the digital revolution's effects on the quality of Australian science fiction. The 1991-93 average was 70 Australian works published per year, with nearly 6.7% recommended by Locus reviewers. In 2017-2019, to the average was 642 works, with just 1.2% recommended. In other words, nine times more works got six times less recognition. Did the digital revolution improve Australian science fiction? Apparently not. How did COVID-19 affect output? In 2019, Australian authors produced 615 works, then in 2020, Australia's strict lockdowns promised a new boom in science fiction output, even under these absolutely ideal conditions. The total number of works published in 2020 was 7% down from the previous record, set nine years earlier. There was an upswing in output, but not a boom. Today, Australian science fiction has mixed prospects. There are regular literary conventions that run at a profit, with attendances of about 200, Yet Australian media conventions can realistically expect 20,000 fans to attend. Science fiction is now big business in Australia, but it is not traditional print science fiction. It is easier than ever to get published, and the best works are serious contenders for the, year, for the world's top awards. But promotion and distribution remain a nightmare. All is not lost, however. Whatever the problems facing us today, I am not worried. The story of Australian science fiction shows that the best is always still to come.